was interesting listening to the previous speakers here. Uh, first of all, uh, I always appreciate listening to the perspectives that we receive from pork producers, poultry <coughs> producers, and many of our other producers and commodity groups because it's an important uh, aspect of what we need to understand and know about how these differences of opinions, how these changes that we may advocate for in animal housing systems actually impact the people that are on the ground doing the job. And so many times that gets lost in the conversation when we talk about a number of these issues. And this gives me uh, a nice lead in to uh, giving you some background. Sherry had contacted me and said she wanted to understand, you know, how do we end up doing this huge project and looking at taking a systems approach of looking at how you transition from a conventional housing system, in this case battery cage system, into uh, other types of housing systems, and in this case what I'm addressing today are the enriched uh, colony cage systems and then also the aviary systems that we have. It really started uh, back with this project that was supported by the American Egg Board called the Social Sustainability of Egg Production Project, or SSEP as we like to reduce those names into acronyms. And this project really started as a result of the mounting frustration that we had as scientists with respect to these headlong activities into focusing only on particular aspects of a housing system, whether it's a matter of behavior, for example, or we take a look at regulations that affect the environment, and so on. And what, what we saw happening is that there were independently made decisions with regard to changing aspects of a system that do actually have impacts on other parts of that system. However, we really have not undertaken the systematic and integrated studies that we need to actually be able to intelligently talk about and have evidence to support what these types of decisions actually have an impact on other parts of the system. And so we started with this particular a project that was funded by um, the American Aid Board back in 2008. And as we pulled together leadership of people in different areas, we identified some of the more critical study areas that we needed to address and look at simultaneously as we began to move forward and develop an understanding of what we know, what we don't know, and what it is we need to find out. And so these are the different areas that we uh, actually identified as being very, um, very important to looking at that overall production system. You can see the individuals that were leading each one of these studies, and in fact you will see um, a number of these people actually stayed on with us to move into the Coalition for Sustainable Egg Supply project that's now taking place. The original idea for this particular, um, this particular study was to do the type of background homework that you need to do before you actually launch into the study, an actual research study of the size and scope of what we are undertaking right now. The other focus was is to target looking at being able to competitive, competitively receive a USDA coordinated agricultural project grant. And those tend to be projects that, that are funded up to about the 20 to $25 million range, sometimes even higher depending on what the focus is. So these are a listing of uh, universities and institutions. And as you can see, we're actually international in scope with this as well. Because one of the things that we do need to do, just like you did this morning, is talk to other people in other countries, in fact, who have undergone some of these changes to get an idea. We had a combination of social scientists on this group, as well as uh, poultry, animal, and environmental scientists. As we progressed through this, we had uh, regular uh, study team workshops in which we pulled these people together. We always typically met simultaneously, and that's because we started with our separate meetings, uh, looking at what we found, reviewing the literature, pulling out the bits and pieces we need, and in some cases doing meta-analysis of data that's already been published, and then coming back together as a group and sharing it across the different groups. And it was incredibly meaningful to do that because then you began to see the areas of overlap that happened between different parts of the system and begin to look at how, in fact, you could coordinate a research project and, and simultaneously 
gather data that can mean something in several different areas. We had a stakeholder workshop that also went with this in Washington, D.C. in 2010. It was held like during the worst blizzard. I'm looking around the room to see if anybody happened to be at that meeting. I don't see anybody. Uh, but we actually, for, for a one and a half day meeting, we ended up there for about four days until we got the planes taking off um, at a national airport again. But at this workshop, when we presented uh, a draft of our reports, and then we have white papers in all these different critical areas that were eventually published in poultry science. Some of the stakeholders in that workshop grabbed hold of it and said, we need to do this study. And regardless of whether we get a federally funded study or not, we need to do this study. And so this project really had a considerable impact in being able to formulate and move forward with a study that eventually became a public-private partnership, for sure. So during this time, we also had meetings that developed a framework for this large-scale study with the intention of looking at submission of a USDA grant, which I think if some people remember the timeline here, we had the economic crash, then USDA decided they weren't going to fund projects for a particular year, and they would combine them. So it was just a total catastrophe looking at that, that uh, uh, dissolve in front of us. And uh, lo and behold, we had this group emerge, the Coalition for Sustainable Egg Production, that said, we'll put money on the table and we'll get this project done. There is a website I'll point out for this. If you want to see uh, results, we do have regular postings on here. We also post more recent papers that have to do with the different areas that we're in. Scientists are right now uh, publishing abstracts and beginning to bring some of the information we have from our first flock forward for presentation at scientific meetings this coming year. It is uh, the primary reason why you are not going to see data. You'll see statements about what we know from our first flock information, but you will not see data in terms of levels of significance and so on. First of all, we don't want to compromise the data. These scientists who have worked on this study, they've got that in, in motion with regard to being published in scientific journals. It's one of the goals of what we set for this, that this would be publicly available uh, information. But you will get a, a walk out of here with an idea of what we did find uh, in general statements uh, in this particular study. The other reason is I'm not a uh, scientist who has depth in every one of those areas. And so it gets difficult when you start asking questions and start drilling into things that I'm not an environmental scientist. That's the best person you need to ask in terms of how they conducted that study. So we composed, uh, composed this coalition of scientists, research institutions, egg suppliers, food manufacturers, food service representatives, retail um, um, people as well. Um, and we uh, have a go-between, and you'll see that here, in the Center for Food Integrity, meaning they are sort of the middle person between the coalition members and also the researchers that are doing, actually doing the project. And there is representation on the leadership team from each of these areas. Uh, Michigan State and the University of California Davis are the lead institutions on, on this grant. And uh, I am a scientific director along with Dr. Joy Mench. Um, the egg supplier representative is Cargill Kitchen Solutions. The food retailer is McDonald's. Uh, the animal well-being uh, from the animal protection sector is American Humane. And then again, the facilitator is the Center for Food Integrity. And so we're the leadership team who discusses a lot of the, the uh, overarching issues that come with this type of project, everything from the gaining of membership, and actually anybody is allowed to gain, to gain membership to this, as long as you adhere to the principles that we laid out with regard to how we're doing this and why we're doing this project. Um, we have advisory members here, and I see ABMA is, is sitting over here. Uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association, the USDA Ag Research Service is engaged, and they are engaged, actually, their subcontractor to us at Michigan State with regard to the food safety work that is happening on this project. And the Environmental Defense Fund is also a non-member advisor. And here are the additional members that we have. And you can see that we even have some of the Canadian egg producers uh, represented on this as well. Um, you will see other universities, such as the University of Guelph, is joined in. They have a, a very dynamic animal uh, 
well-being group uh, there at University of Guelph. We frequently work with them. They also have an alternative system they're working with as well, so they're very interested in the data that we're doing and sharing information back and forth. Um, Purdue University as well, you see our Culture Science Association is a member, and so on. So it's quite a variety of members that have joined into this coalition. And I mentioned before the three types of housing systems that we are looking at. We're basically conducting this study on a very large commercial uh, egg producing operation. And on this operation, they, they have always had conventional cage systems, but they have added uh, both an enriched colony system and also a cage-free aviary system for the distinct purpose of starting the study, and then they will carry on with the production uh, in those facilities for different markets that they're going out to at the same time. Um, the enriched colony and cage-free aviary involved having to do building at the site. So you'll see the timeline here in a minute in terms of when we actually started into this project and when the building was, was finished and where we placed uh, Flock One. We have again used five sustainability areas, uh, critical areas that we think environment, food safety, worker safety. We have, um, we're working with uh, individuals out of UC Davis with respect to uh, human medicine. So you, you, again, have a variety of scientists that are engaged in this project, and I'll, I'll show you the different aspects of things that they are measuring. Animal health and well-being, and then, of course, the food affordability component. And for those of you who are not familiar with poultry, this is a conventional cage system, otherwise known as battery cages. This is an enriched colony system, which actually is an enlargement of a cage system, but it has additional perches, nest box and scratch area for the hens to be able to exhibit uh, natural behaviors. <clears throat> and this is the aviary system that we're looking at. And in this system, what you have is you have a middle litter area, and there is litter that goes underneath this system as well. Hens will exit this part of the system down at the bottom. As they move up, you will find tiers of perches. You will find food typically in the middle, and nest boxes at the very top of this particular unit, and it's accessed from an aisle that is behind that unit in terms of egg production. And this is also highly mechanized in that you have manure belts running underneath of this. You also have an egg belt on the outside that moves and removes eggs from the nest box area. This gives you some idea of the housing characteristics. Um, <clears throat> to avoid having to um, build another conventional cage system simply to match what we had. We used an existing building, filled it with hens, and then we have to statistical consultants that are on this, um, on this study. Uh, MSU, one cycle of MSU is on this study. And we have adjusted sampling within the conventional house system to be able to match what we're doing uh, within our aviary and bridge system. We're using loam and white. Uh, and it's consistent across. People have asked us about different genetics. We don't want to go there yet. We really need to look at this from the framework of a single genetic line, and then additional studies may be done in looking at changing up the genetics of these animals in these different systems. <clears throat> and it just gives you an idea that all of these have a level of mechanization in terms of manure belt hand handling. They're all indoor systems. We did not choose to do a free-range system uh, in terms of outdoor systems. And some of the manure characteristics, and then a photo light period down here at the bottom. Here's our research timeline. Um, construction and early research began in 2010. We went back to um, the hatchery and also to the pullet raising facilities, and we did some preliminary work in terms of looking at health uh, parameters and so on on these individuals in terms of their coming in. Uh, that's so that we know at the time of placement that we have proper back background and baseline data for each of these flocks. We finished off the uh, facility in uh, 2011, and the first placement of hens actually happened right at that time as well. We've just we placed our uh, second research flocks in June 2012. We completed our first um, our first flock in. Um, in 2012 and had preliminary research that was presented in 2012 and then the second block will be completed uh, in 2014 and then we'll have all hopefully have all of our stuff published by 2015. So it takes quite a bit of time if you might imagine if you're looking at the volume of data. 
<clears throat> that we have, and any of you who, who um, think about bioinformatics, for example, and taking these huge data sets and being able to mesh them and look for patterns and so on within them, it becomes very, very important to have this type of software and also the storage capacity to be able to deal with these types of data sets. You're talking just even in the behavior area, terabytes and terabytes of information that you have to store to be able to, to look at these, these sets. Just to give you a bird's eye view of what we've been measuring in each of these areas, um, this is Dina Jones at the bottom, and she is leading this from USDA ARS. Um, it's a, our research, we have sub-areas that we call within a research category. Um, in this case, we're looking at stereo egg quality, and you can get an idea of all the different parameters that we are measuring. It's typical to what they measure in egg research <clears throat> with regard to exterior egg quality. Strength, the, the, the shell itself, taking a look at the aspect of the shell, the cracking of the shells, that's very important with regard to food safety. You do not want anything to enter inside of that egg. And then also looking at how these eggs were great when they come out of the system. We look at the interior quality as well. So, yolk index, haw units, and so on. For those of you who are familiar with poultry <coughs> research, particularly in egg quality, you take a look at that, and you certainly know what that means. The microbial evaluations themselves, and looking at the populations of microbes on the, on the eggs, in the laying house, also within the processing facilities. Very, very important thing to do, especially when you're evaluating these different systems. And then also, <clears throat> the hen's immunological response. You know, what's she experiencing within these facilities? And so we're saying them for those as well. The area of worker health and safety, <clears throat> uh, UC Davis has been leading the charge on this particular area. Frank Mitloner is working with the interior air quality uh, relative to human health, along with a couple of colleagues in the College of medicine there. As you see, we've got somebody blowing into, one of the workers blowing into a device that measures pulmonary function, and some of you have, have seen those before, particularly measuring that. And then this is a backpack that the workers carry into the unit, and it collects data as they go on air quality and exposure within that particular building. And it's important to put it on the worker because it's the exposure that they get at the level at which they're working. <clears throat> We're also looking at the ergonomics of these different systems and the impact on the mucoskeletal system of the workers themselves. Um, we're looking at the differences between what they experience and also looking at some of the risks that are involved in each one of these particular systems relative to, to those workers. Hen, and, hen health and well-being. Our sub-area is resource and space use. We have over 300 cameras that are mounted within this facility. And I think Sherry could probably relate to this from the days of doing her work, that and we have reams and reams of data. And of course, we have tons of undergraduate students that are fully employed looking at this and collecting data off of these videos. We will be testing a sensor product um, coming this year is a, a, a product that was developed with a USDA grant at MSU between us and the College of uh, uh, Engineering to see how these uh, sensors will work, uh, biosensors will work on these birds as they're moving through a system. It's also being trained right now with regard to setting up an algorithm for movement, uh, hen resource use and, use and so on. We're hoping to be able to, to deploy that system sometime during the second flight cycle. But in the meantime, we're doing a lot of looking at resource and space use based on the system. And these are just giving you some of the different camera views, a view from the lower level, from the feed aisle, and then from the ceiling. Um, and in this case, we're using the aviary system uh, here as an example. We also have developed uh, a standardized method of evaluation of of hen welfare. It's very much based on the animal quality um, audits, animal welfare quality audits that have come out of the EU. However, we have modified them a bit. I know a lot of people who have modified them. I know they've done that in Canada as well because some of the things we just were not going to go there in terms of measuring. But we're looking at um, heat stress, keel bone deformation, foot pads, 
toe conditions in large crops, eye condition, lice and mite infestation. There's been uh, some problems with more extensive systems in Europe with regard to mites, on the proliferation of mites. Comb abnorm abnormalities, beak condition, skin lesions, plumage damage, and so on. And they're being evaluated across all three systems. And <clears throat> we do this on a regular basis. We'll have team scientists that go in, and they spend probably three days going through uh, all of them, with sampling different parts of the house, different birds, and um, taking random samples. That will give us an idea of what they score. We have hen health as well. Um, Evaluating the health of this, looking at daily mortalities, uh, determining causes of uh, mortality, doing uh, hen necropsies. Uh, we have a breeder company veterinarian that also visits on a regular ba basis in, in, uh, in, in, in conjunction with our research veterinarian that's working on this. Uh, and we're consistently taking blood samples. And then we're doing skeletal health evaluation. This is very important. Uh, there are differences in terms of looking at breaking of bones and so on within each of these systems, and also bone development. <clears throat> Dr. Mike Orth has been leading this part of the study, and Mike is with uh, Michigan State University. Um, looking at the, the blood markers um, for uh, bone development, looking at the tibia and humerus, and in particular like leg and wing bones, and then bone mineral density and morphology in terms of what does that bone look like? And this is sort of what you're looking at from CT um, that we're taking on all of these, these animals. And you can see that they're, they're moving in with this. And we're also working with our College of Human Medicine on this as well. And then looking at stress factors in hens, um, looking, we do take some invasive measures and then non-invasive me measures. At the time that they are normally collecting blood for other reasons, we also get a sample at that time to be able to use in, in evaluating. It's one of the things about getting these teams of scientists together is that <clears throat> we can do things all at one time. And if we know all the measures that we all need to take, we can look at how we cross over on those measures and then make sure we take an appropriate volume to be able to get all the data that we need. And we're also using egg corticosterone as a, a measure uh, in a non-invasive sense. <clears throat> Environmental impact, Dr. Hung Wei Shen from Iowa State University is leading this part of the study. He's looking at air emissions, and he's also looking at em emissions inside the house, ventilation, uh, and so on. This is, uh, this is called Trudy. She's our, she's our uh, instrument. I think there's only two of these in the United States. And since Trudy has been part of a larger USDA study that, has take, that was funded, I think, about three years ago, in looking at emissions for poultry housing, it seemed to make sense to use the same unit to be able to do, conduct this study here. And <clears throat> this is collecting samples 24-7. This goes continuously. So it's a continuous stream of data that's coming in through Trudy. This is the inside of this mobile unit, getting an idea of what that looks like. And then looking at all the different things that they are sampling as well. They're also uh, looking at the manure constituents as well. They're looking at particulates within uh, that manure study, the gas uh, emissions from that. Um, they are also looking at the types of components that are coming out in the uh, manure, the nutrients, the solids, the pH, the ammonia content, and total nitrogen content of that manure. We have a data modeler. Um, she, uh, she is from the University of California, Davis. She is modeling all this data in terms of looking at how they integrate the total and, and get an idea of what the total emissions are, the types of gases that are being produced inside manure, outside, and um, then modeling the indoor air quality in particular with regard to uh, the quality of air, the thermal conditions, gas emissions, and so on within that house. And of course, you can see how that will intermix with what we're getting on the worker health aspect as well. So they, th these two groups talk a lot with each other with regard to what they're, they're getting and sharing data. The last piece of this is food affordability. And Dr. Dan Sumner of University of California, Davis, is leading this, this effort. These are the different areas that we are, he's looking at in analyzing relative to egg production. 
uh, looking at production costs and revenues that are happening uh, and moving all that data around to take a look at what we have in that particular area. So here are the preliminary findings, and I, I'm labeling all these preliminary findings. Uh, not all of the data was completely uh, developed at the time that we presented this to the coalition last October. What we presented and what we will give to you here are preliminary results that we know from three different areas. The two areas that were not presented were the worker health and the food safety at that particular meeting. Those will be presented this fall to the coalition for Flock 1 and maybe perhaps some of Flock 2 data that gets put in there. And we make very sure to say this is preliminary because we don't want people trotting out of here and trying to use this as a definitive statement as to what's going on because we're already seeing some differences in Flock 2. One of the other aspects of this study before I go into, the, um, into this is that we realize we had the opportunity to watch a commercial unit that had traditionally operated with battery cave systems go into a new system and be able to look at how they transitioned. So we have actively watched the transitioning, things that there were problems with with regard to the workers being able to cope with when they first started this um, endeavor. And I think some of this does get reflected in our first block data because these workers are totally inexperienced in terms of working within these systems. And so we had the opportunity, and we will capture and actually probably publish a paper on what this transition meant to these workers in this particular facility. So this is about all the hard data you're going to get uh, with respect to this, giving you some of the production parameters and what we found. And again, I'll, I'll tell you that the sampling was figured out for the conventional system since we had a uh, larger number of hens in that system. <clears throat> On the right hand, we do have the references that are typically given by the breeder, uh, Lone and White, in terms of what they felt that this breed ought to do within these different systems. And so we give you the hen numbers for house, we look at the mortality figures, and I think there's some of these that jump right out at you there. Um, the average um, egg production that, that com comes out of this, hen day, HD means hen day egg production. Um, eggs per hen housed, case weights that you get, feed per, per hundred weight, water per hundred weight. Uh, in some cases, the feed you'll see, but they don't typically give a reference value for that for this particular animal. Um, and I, from what I understand, NIA will have this available to you to look at afterwards. Um, so don't sit there and try to write this all down. I see some people writing out there. Uh, feed conversion values, body weight, and so on. So that's some of the um, some of the dynamics that you see from the time of placement at week 19 through the time that these, this flock was was uh, taken out of production. So in terms of head health and welfare, I think as you looked at that slide, you saw that you had approximately double the mortality rate over the life of that flock in the aviator system than you did in both the enriched and conventional. This is not surprising to, to most of us who have been watching the data and, and looking at what has come out of Europe and some of the other published studies on this, we seem to hold true to that. And a lot of it is due to the conditions associated with egg production itself and then the behavioral issues that do develop with regard to excessively uh, excessive pecking or being picked out at the vent level. Um, hens in the enriched system did experience some more fractured wings and legs in placement to the house. A lot of this we're looking at in terms of one of the transitional features that you see happening when people start dealing with loading hens into a different system. Uh, even though this is still a cage system, it still has some differences about it with regard to getting those hens in. But we're, we're dissecting this data just a bit more to see uh, whether or not it might have been a combination of workers, combination of hens that are coming out of a cage produced system and into that system. Uh, of perches and, and so on, and so we need to look at the dynamics that happen there. We're looking at this very closely in Flock 2, now that the workers have had some experience within this system and, and able to do a load-in, uh, probably with more confidence this time around. Um, we also know that the aviary and rich systems both had a higher incidence of keel breastbone deviations. Now, much of the literature on this usually attribute this to roosting on perch. 
And so we're, again, dissecting that one out, trying to look at the different features. It's one reason why the bone data is very, very important here. And then being able to look at this morphologically <coughs> relative to the perch and the different situations that these animals are in, uh, the amount of time that they perch, and so on, from the behavioral aspect. We know that conventional cages had the high, highest incidence of foot problems, mainly hyperkeratosis. Again, not, not an astounding revelation. This is something that happens. Typically, you do get abrasion, certain amount of abrasion on foot pads of those animals, and then we begin to get that hyperkeratosis. When the aviary hens had foot problems, they typically were more severe, and that is usually because of litter contact. All right, the higher moisture and so on. These hens in cages are up off of moisture, so you can see a different foot problem with them than you are with the hens that had contact with litter. Even though they had a lower incidence, when they did have instances of that, it was more, more severe. We found that the conventional enriched hens had cleaner feathers, and, but there was worse feather cover, um, but they have worse, worse feather cover. Part of that has to do with the cage or cage abrasion that happens there as well in terms of moving in and out of feeding systems and so on. So the plumage quality was actually better, meaning there was more plumage on, the, on those hens in the aviary system. However, they were dirtier hens. And if you think about it, they're down again in the litter. They do dust bathing and so on in those systems. It could be affiliated with, with some of the um, activity that happens there. So, um, we had large areas of feather loss, as I mentioned before, um, more body heat and so on that, that was detected. We had a thermographic camera that went through and we actually photographed these hens and you could see the, the heat coming off these hens. And it is in one indication of <coughs> feather loss. And the patterns of feather loss suggested that hens in conventional enriched cages lost their feathers more due to cage, what we call cage abrasion, again, moving in and out and around that cage and hitting objects within the cage, than in the aviary system. Whereas the aviary system, those birds lost feathers due to pecking, primarily due to pecking and aggressive behavior of other hens. <clears throat> in terms of the environmental findings, um, very good indoor air quality with regards to ammonia and particulate matter within the conventional and enriched houses, very low. Again, this was not an unanticipated result. We figured this would happen again. We don't have litter in those houses. Aviary ammonia levels are uh, one to two times, 1.5 to two times higher. Certainly likely due to manure on the floor. Uh, typically, after the flock is done, they clean the manure out of the system. So these birds basically are down in litter. The, if you keep the system dry enough, the litter becomes dry, but there's also manure mixed in. And uh, this is one reason why you do get those higher ammonia levels. It's really very important to use proper ventilation rates and also monitor moisture in those situations as well. And you can get the ammonia down to a reasonable level uh, when you're very, uh, <clears throat> very astute with regard to mitigation strategies and handling manure and ventilation rates within the barns. Very important thing for people who want to raise chickens and aviaries. The dust bathing and foraging in the aviary system generated uh, was generated eight to ten times more dust. And you figure that birds get down. If any of you have watched them dust bathe, they get down inside and then begin to move, and and you start the dust flying up into the air. And of course, even the the, the jumping down and jumping back into the system also brings particulate up into the air. Um, ammonia and particulate matter emissions uh, from the highest from the houses were highest for the aviary, followed by the conventional house and the lowest, which was interesting to us in the enriched cage system. Methane emissions were very low for all houses, very low. They were very, very low, but well within acceptable levels. The electricity use was also similar across the three systems. However, they did have supplemental heat that was provided through propane systems, so this will go into the energy figure that we will eventually look at for all of these houses. But it wouldn't be reflected in uh, electricity use. Food affordability. Again, this isn't necessarily surprising for overall cost. It was highest in eggs from the aviary system, followed by those from the enriched, and then by the conventional housing system. Uh, annual operating costs, and that, that's looking at all the, the parameters that we had listed before, feed, bullet, labor costs were highest for the aviary system, as we might anticipate, while the two other systems were lower and very similar to one another with respect to those costs. 
And once again, capital costs were higher for the aviary system. Enriched were next. Uh, and, and then the conventional. And part of this may have to do to those transitional costs of the barns and the equipment that are actually factored in when you make that type of transition. So the second flock will be very interesting to look at. Since they're already up and running, they've hopefully captured some of those costs off the first flock. And we'll see some of those differences coming into the second group.